four, three, two, one. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Chris. I am the founder of Evolution Automotive, and uh, I am going to, well, I've already started a podcast on another channel, but uh, I just wanted to give you guys uh, a little personable insight onto, uh, into, not onto, uh, into the way I uh, plan on moving forward with this business. Um, as you may or may not know, this is a business that is focused on electric vehicles, uh, primarily Teslas. Uh, it will expand um, as things start moving forward. Uh, and the, the whole goal is to be an all-inclusive uh, one-stop shop pretty much for all things EV. Um, detailing, vinyl wraps, uh, paint protection films, uh, performance parts. That's a thing we're going to be working a lot on, actually. Uh, there's, there's not a lot of that going on in the, uh, in the electric vehicle market right now. There are some very proficient people in the industry who make very, very awesome cars uh, usually focused on converting additional uh, converting uh, traditional cars taking uh, the gas engines out putting in uh, electric motors and everything like that and uh, going from there uh, I do want to focus on conversions at some point in the future that's not going to be something we focus on from the get-go because there is a lot of engineering that goes into that, a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of money. There will be uh, uh, kits that we plan on producing where, sort of like what GM has done with their the eCopo, where they take an existing platform they make more or less a drop-in conversion setup where all you do is you supply your batteries. I think that's a, that's a fantastic business model to go by. Uh, but here, we're going to focus more on the economical aspect of it. Converting older cars with uh, much more efficient electric motors and inverter systems, uh, lightweight batteries, stuff like that. We don't need a car that makes a thousand horsepower. We don't need a car that goes 500 miles to a charge. We want to be able to bring reasonably cost conversion kits to market. So say somebody has a 2005 Honda Civic. Something like that. Something you can pick up for $1,500, $2,000, good condition. And they want to take the engine out and they want to put an electric motor in. Something that's not going to cost them $20,000 to do. They can take uh, 150 horsepower electric motor from pretty much any EV has something like that. The Teslas are a little on the extreme side. Model 3 is over 300 horsepower, 350 volts. The Model S's are, the, the small motors are around 250 horsepower each at 350 to 400 volts. The large motors are upwards of 500 horsepower, 400 volts on some of them. We don't need to focus on stuff like that. Although, I will say, the Model 3 motor from Tesla is $2,500 new. That's the, you can't really get a more economical drop-in sort of thing like that right now. It's got, you've got the, the motor, the inverter, the transmission, differential, everything all in one drive unit for $2,500. And they make, three, they make over 300 horsepower at 350 volts. 
So if you take something like that, you you drop it into a front wheel drive car because it's, it's a it's got a transaxle setup in it. It, it. it more or less is a transaxle with the motor built into it, and you just drop it in. It's a fully self contained unit. You take something like that, you make a custom mount where it can just drop into a, any different front wheel drive car. You put uh, a 20 kilowatt hour battery in it, nothing nothing crazy. And you, you should be able to get, if, if a 75 kilowatt hour battery in a Model 3 can take it, give or take 300 miles, something like a 20 kilowatt hour battery, you should be able to get 75 miles out of it. It's going to be lighter. Theoretically, it should be lighter than a Model 3. You don't have the autopilot technology. The I think the key to getting more people on board with the electric car is to make it so that they can get into an electric car economically. Right now, the cheapest way to get into an electric car is a, a Nissan Leaf or a Chevy Bolt. Uh, new, new, I mean, and they're going to cost you between thirty and forty thousand dollars. The you can go into the dealership and negotiate and tax credits and all this other stuff, but the the thing that I want to point out about tax credits is that it's not taking anything off of the price of the car. That is a common misperception that if I buy a $50,000 Model 3 right now, I get a $7,500 tax credit, I'm out the door with that thing for forty two five. That's not true. You are still paying $50,000 for that car, and you're not getting $7,500 back. Uh, that's another common misperception. You have things... You have a tax liability. That tax liability is the taxes that you owe to the federal government. If you have, and it, the, that tax liability, it doesn't matter how much you pay throughout the year or if you don't pay anything at all, your tax liability is on a sliding scale based on how much money you make. And then uh, you go, you have different deductions and credits and stuff like that to take away from that. So if you have uh, a tax liability of $10,000, and you've paid ten thousand dollars into it uh, at the end of the year when you do your taxes it's a wash you get no money back you owe no more money if you take that tax credit and you apply that it reduces your tax liability by seventy five hundred dollars uh, a deduction reduces your taxable income which it, I'm not a tax professional. There's, there's all kinds of stuff that goes on with that. So if you take your ten thousand dollars, and that's your that's your tax liability, you've paid ten thousand dollars. You wind up at zero. Now, you take that seventy five hundred dollar tax credit. You've still paid the ten thousand dollars, but now your liability is down to twenty five hundred dollars. You do get that seventy five hundred dollar back, seventy five hundred dollars back in the form of a refund. It's yet to be seen how this whole political climate's going to play into that. I'm not going to get involved in that. Well, it's all speculation on both sides of the aisle. They're all idiots. Well, let's not focus on that. But at the end of the day, you are still paying a pretty substantial amount of money to get into a new electric car. Getting into a used electric car is much more reasonable. You can pick up a Nissan Leaf for $10,000 right now. You could probably pick up a Nissan Leaf, five-year-old Nissan Leaf for, I don't know, under ten grand. Uh, let's see. Uh, actually, let's let's look this up. Let's see what we can get a, a 2014 Nissan Leaf. Let's see what we can get one of those for. 2014 Nissan Leaf. Uh, we're gonna go to Car Gurus. Uh, da -da. 
2014 Nissan Leaf SV 61,000 miles for 7,900. That's in Hawaii. Okay, we're not. Unless you're in Hawaii, that doesn't do you any good. Oh, excuse me. 2014 Nissan Leaf SL in Finlay, Ohio, 39,000 miles, $9,500. San Diego, 2015 Nissan Leaf SL in San Diego, 38,500 miles for 9,900. 2015 Nissan Leaf in Bloomfield, New Jersey, 15,478 miles for 12,885, down from 14,885. Oh, here we go. Here's a here's a good one. 2013 Nissan Leaf S, which would be a base model. Crestwood, Kentucky, 57,500 miles. You're looking at $5,250 for that car. Now, these are these are great deals. These are fantastic deals, and if you're looking to get into an electric car, that would be the way to go. Honestly, that would really be the way to go. Uh, the main issue that I've seen with the Nissan Leaf, I have, I've never owned a Leaf, so I can't speak from personal experience, so take everything I say on this with a grain of salt. However, one of the drawbacks I've seen from the forums and everything like that with the Nissan Leaf is they do not have active battery cooling. So, in the heat, the, the biggest killer of lithium batteries of most batteries in general is heat. Heat kills everything. It, 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 it deteriorates the lifespan of these batteries. And because there is no active cooling in a Nissan Leaf, the batteries get hot and they wear out. It's just the way they are. The Teslas and uh, like the Chevy Bolt and stuff like that, they all have might be wrong about the Chevy Bolt. The Teslas, I know for a fact, have active battery cooling. They use the AC system to cool down the coolant running through the battery to keep everything manageable. And that also allows for uh, much faster charging. You're limited on the fast charging with the Leaf because of the battery cooling. Some of them don't even have it, but that's, that's the trade-off you're getting. You have a very, very, very reasonably priced vehicle that is arguably incredibly reliable. Uh, the, the FDNY has a ton of these things, and they drive them every day. They charge them every day. They're always running, and you don't really hear many problems with these things. So the Leaf would be the good way to go if you're just looking to get into a car that you need 50 to 100 miles just to drive back and forth. It would be perfect for that. But let's be honest, it kind of looks like a frog. Um, especially if you get one in like that weird green color. It's not really green, it's like a goldish gray tan. The, that typical early generation uh, Toyota Prius color is what I'm going to call it. It's like a yeah. I'm looking at oh this one looks this one looks like a gray gold, but they they look like frogs. They really do look like frogs, and it's not for everybody. So what I want to do here at Evolution is I want to be able to provide very reasonable cost conversions for whatever car people want to do it to. You figure you could probably use these battery packs. The Nissan Leaf battery pack and add some sort of active cooling to it to keep everything in check uh, with, the, with the Tesla Model 3 switch reluctance partial permanent magnet motor. Drop that whole thing in, you're probably looking at $7,500 for a conversion? I don't know. I don't know. There's something I have to... Uh, I'm doing more and more research on. The fabrication and everything is fine. Uh, that's that's not an issue. Getting the, the electronics and everything, that, that's... Getting all that stuff working is not an issue. But the economics behind it is where that's going to take a lot of time because, let's face it, the, the prices of these cars are going to keep coming down 
and the prices of the technology is going to keep coming down. But not everybody wants a Tesla. Not everybody wants a Nissan Leaf. Not everybody wants a Chevy Bolt. Some people like their cars. Actually, most people get a pretty fond, get pretty fondly attached to their cars. And especially as regulations start coming down over the next 20 or so years that start banning fossil fuel powered vehicles, the aftermarket industry is going to start to take off and blow up and everything like that. Uh, I do think 2019, 2019 and 2020, I think these two years are really where the whole paradigm is going to shift over. I think, I think, I think, I think, I hope, um, but I really do think that 2019 is the year for the electric car. If not 2019, most definitely 2020. I think either one of those, maybe both of them, will be the year for the electric car. We're going to start seeing them. They're going to be more commonplace in places outside of California. They're going to be more commonplace around the world. We're going to start to see how viable they are on their own. Everyone always talks about the subsidies and everything like that. Most of the people who bring those up are ignorant and don't know what the hell they're talking about. They bring it up as a, uh, as a detraction point. Oh, uh, Tesla and GM, the electric car industry is subsidized. We're not. Now that the both GM and Tesla and soon Nissan uh, have hit their 200,000 car mark, their subsidies are dying out. That the rest of the manufacturers are still going to have theirs because they're they're late to the game. But that might have been their plan all along. We're now we're going to start to see their self-sufficient viability. How many people are still going to buy these cars without the seventy-five hundred dollar tax credit? Um, how many people are going to buy these cars without the HOV lane? stickers to to allow them to drive in the HOV lane with only one person. If you're buying a car because you can drive in the HOV lane by yourself, I mean, the, the, your thought process is a little skewed, in my opinion. I'm not trying to attack anybody. If that's your reason for buying one of these electric cars, uh, it, it's a little... The thinking's a little backwards, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Especially in places like California, where it doesn't matter if you're in the HOV lane or not, you're still sitting in traffic. Same thing here on Long Island. I can I can drive in the HOV lane. I have a clean pass sticker. The HOV lane is just as backed up as all the other lanes. There's times the HOV lane is more backed up than the other lanes because there's just white painted lines on the ground and people can jump in and out at any time. It's a pretty poor setup for an HOV link, but neither here nor there. So the economics of conversions is yet to be seen. I would imagine people doing um, engine swaps on their cars. You've got... Uh, like in the Honda community, I know the B18 and the B16 and, and engine swaps like that are very common. It's more more for performance than anything else with something like that. But I would imagine some people do it for efficiency and whatnot. I don't know. I'm not involved in that. Uh, I was always a, an LS guy. LS swapped the world. Uh, the LS platform, you can put it in anything. I'm pretty sure it's been swapped into everything at this point. There's even a picture online of it, of a uh, Tesla Model S with an LS3 under the hood, but that makes its way around every once in a while. But that, that was a, a joke by East Bay Muscle Cars in California. They were taking a salvaged Model S and turning it into a desk for, uh, oh, 
on what university. I don't remember what university it was for. But they took the car and they made it into a desk. But before they did that, they dropped in a uh, an LS3, took a picture of it, posted it online, and went viral, and now it's all over the place. So I do think... I do think there is a new a, gen, a new generation of conversions coming. I think we're going to see things that are a little bit different, whereas the most of the engine swaps and conversions you see on cars out there are more for performance. I think as we start to progress a little bit, I think we're going to start seeing conversions that are more for daily driving where you take something, you take a nice small family car, uh, Volkswagen Jetta, Honda Civic, uh, Toyota Camry, stuff like that, and you take the, the gas drivetrain out, you drop it in an electric drivetrain, and you just continue to drive it as normal, but you plug in at home, you plug in at work, and it makes life easier. May or may not be cheaper. We'll see. Right now... Driving wise, having an electric car is cheaper than using gas. Even though gas is at a, a very, a very low rate right now, that's not going to last forever. But even at this low rate, driving an electric car is generally cheaper per mile than an equivalent gas car. Usually, it's more. It's cheaper per mile than even a really good hybrid car like a Prius or something like that. We're not talking the cost of the car because if you factor in the cost of the car right now, the technology is, it's not new technology, but it's its newly adopted technology. And that, that always carries a premium. So some people say that oh i buy a model 3 it's so much cheaper than my toyota camry i had before it it's not it, it really isn't the i've done the camry hybrid i've done the avalon hybrid the model s the model x the the cheapest one out of them all believe it or not was actually a, the 2015 avalon hybrid that was the cheapest one I uh, ran that commercially for 340,000 miles, and the only real repair it ever needed the entire time was the right front hub bearing. Other than that, tires, put gas in it, and ran that thing. It was down to like four or five cents a mile to run that car. It was It was insane. And the sticker on it was... $34,000 came with a three year 150,000 mile warranty bumper to bumper uh, leather interior, JBL sound system heated seats, whole nine yards great car, fantastic car uh, actually I kind of want to buy another one because they really are they're comfortable, they're quiet they're not slow and they get ridiculously good gas mileage sitting driving back and forth from here to LaGuardia three times in a day, getting 60, 62, 63 miles to the gallon, which is obscene, especially since it's, it's kind of bordering on the full-sized car. It's a, it's a big car, and it's comfortable. I, I love them, and they're ungodly reliable. Ungodly reliable. But... We're going to start seeing, I think we're going to start seeing a shift in the thinking where we're not going to be doing conversions on cars to make them go faster. We're going to be doing conversions on cars to make them, make them more efficient. And uh, running, running an electric car is almost always going to be cheaper per mile than anything else out there, mainly based on thermal efficiency. Uh, the electric drives in these cars are upwards of 80% thermally efficient, whereas even a hybrid, you're maybe going to break 50, 55% thermal efficiency. You're still creating a ton of heat, but I'm, I'm curious to see how hybrid technology advances because Formula One is hybrid and they're going to stay hybrid. 
and I think we're going to start seeing that technology trickle down to the consumer market. But we'll see. I do think we're going to start to see conversions that focus on efficiency. Um, the one thing that the first project that I have planned, I'm waiting on the motors, is not for efficiency at all. It's purely for fun. Is uh, I have the Crown Vic P71 police interceptor. The that car is going to come in. The body is going to get pulled off the frame. The motor, the transmission, the rear differential, everything is going to get ripped out of it. All the all the fuel system, that's all going to get ripped out. All the emissions, it's all going to get ripped out. And in between the frame rails, I'm going to be putting most likely second generation Chevy Volt battery modules in there. Each battery module is 48 volts nominal. You figure you take the entire Chevy Volt battery pack has seven of those in it in a T-shape and it comes down and it's in the behind the rear seats or under the rear seats is, it goes um, perpendicular to the to the body line and then through the what would be the transmission tunnel in any other car is where the rest of the modules are want to take something like that take eight of them get it up closer to 400 volts lay them in between the frame rails in a, in a heavy duty steel case that has some sort of uh, cooling setup going through it and a uh, in the back, I want to build a, a rear cradle where the rear dif differential would be. I want to build a rear cradle that houses the uh, a Tesla Model 3 switch reluctance partial permanent magnet motor. We're just going to call it a, a PMAG motor from now on. But I want it to house that. I want it to house two of them, actually, and have them, have them offset so they can fit nice and close together. Uh, I've actually been speaking with somebody at the uh, National Electric Drag Racing Association about designing and building a transmission case that mimics what Tesla has already done, but Tesla has it so you have the motor on one side and the inverter on the other side, the transmission runs through, through the middle in between them and then the axles come out and they go out to the wheels. I want to take that same design, but instead of the motor being here, the inverter being here, I want to offload the inverter, put the inverter somewhere else, probably in the trunk, and then have a motor and a motor that spin opposite directions. Uh, the the left-hand motor will spin clockwise, the right-hand motor will spin anti-clockwise, and they'll, they'll both be tied together, and they will drive a factory-styled reduction gear set and it'll still work the same way because <clears throat> the whole goal is to be able to use a platform like the Panther platform for the Crown Victoria because you can take the body off it and do whatever you want to do you have you, it's two frame rails you can do whatever you want with it, it it's a it's a blank slate and the goal is to be able to do that as a proof of concept and to be able to just beat the hell out of the damn thing, find out what's going to break and continually engineer and re-engineer everything so that we can provide reliable stress-tested components to be able to offer the general public something that they can put in their car and drive forever. That's the goal. We'll see how it goes. It may or may not work. It should work. It, actually, I, I don't know. I don't even know why I said it may or may not work. It, it will work. It's a. Uh, it's just a matter of implementing it uh, and not going bankrupt before I implement it. But I don't. I don't have any doubt in my mind. We could get something out there available to the public. To be able to do this to their own cars or they drop their car off here and we do it for them but the whole the whole thing is it's got to be reasonably priced it can't be obscene 
Um, it can't be a $50,000 conversion. Unless they want to go really, really fast. If they want to go really, really fast, then that's a whole different ballgame. We will be doing that, too. But the, there's a there's a 10-year plan that I have. The, the first year, we're, we're in year one right now. Year one just started. January 1st, we are, we are what? We are 10 days into year one. And uh, the whole plan, the first five years is, the year one is getting established, getting everything set up, and getting the ball rolling. Years two through five are going to be the growth phase where we start designing stuff and building stuff and fabricating and, and doing all this, all the, the, the back end stuff, all the hard work where we just, we try to get things to work. We try to get proof of concepts out. We, we do all this stuff and we try to get things built up. And then the second half of the 10 year plan is going to be for perfection. Um, I actually can't say perfection anymore. I guess it was a friend of mine told me I gotta stop chasing perfection and I fully, fully, fully agree with him. We can't be perfectionists because we'll go crazy trying to chase perfection. We have to change our mindset to, to something that he dubbed meticulism. I can't take any credit for that. That is entirely on him. Uh, he will be on, hopefully I can get him on the other podcast at some point. Uh, shouldn't be a problem. Shouldn't be a problem at all. But we got to start focusing less on perfectionism and more on meticulism. The way he described it was focus on 80%. If, if I can do something to 80%, I find something that I'm good at and I get, and I can do it to 80% every single time consistently. I can be meticulous in my uh, methodology and get 80% every single time and just come up with a system 80%, 80%, 80%, 80%, 80% regardless of what happens and find somebody else who that remaining 20% they can be meticulous within that and they can they can achieve 80% 80% 80% 80% consistently and do it every single time because if you take 80% and you take 80% of the remaining 20% you have a final product that is 96% perfect and that 96% perfect is going to take less time, less energy, it's gonna stress you out so much less than trying to get to 100% every single time. Sometimes you'll get to 100%, most of the time you're not gonna get anywhere close. So if you take 80% and then 80% of that remaining 20%, you have 96% perfect and you can duplicate that over and over and over and over again you can systemize it and now you've got a a, a 96 percent perfect product without any polishing or refinement you have a 96 percent perfect product that you and somebody else didn't go crazy trying to produce you did what you know how to do and you have a product that is damn near perfect without going crazy trying to make it so so all thanks to him, I've started to change the way I think of things to be meticulous in my methodology without chasing perfection. So the, the second half of the 10 year plan is about setting up and being able to reproduce over and over and over again. We'll, we'll call it a ramp up. Being able to reproduce over and over and over again that same 96% perfect product regardless of what it is and be able to build and and grow and everything like that the i haven't gotten to the 
11 to 20 year plan just yet, but that's very, very ambitious. Uh, I do want to start my own car company. Not like Volkswagen or GM, thinking more along the lines of like a, a Lotus or something like that, a very, very reasonably priced, the higher end, um, fun performance car. Not something that can drive itself, not something that can change lanes automatically, not something that you can take from New York to California in two days without stopping because you can fall asleep behind the wheel and it'll drive itself to charges and then give. No, no. Bare bones, safe, reliable, fun. That's that's it. Safe, reliable, and fun. SRF. Safe, reliable, fun. And if it gets 100, 150 miles of range, that's perfect. It doesn't need any more than that. Uh, but it has to be fun. It has to be. It, it, where cars are starting to get very boring. Well, actually, I take that back. For a while, cars were very boring. Now they're starting to come back. They're starting to come back around into the fun. Even, even like the little Kias and Hyundai's and stuff like that, they are, they're, they're fun little cars to drive. And uh, I gotta say, the new Kia Stinger is, you know what, they, that's a pretty awesome car. I drove one a couple weeks ago and I was very, very, very impressed with it. You're talking a sub $50,000 car that's got, what, 400 horsepower, twin turbo, V6, all wheel drive, family sedan. Uh, it, it definitely takes on like the 335i, or maybe even, no, it definitely doesn't take on the M3. The M3 is in a totally different class, but it definitely takes on the, the 335i uh, head on. It definitely takes it head on, and it's a very well done car, but that's off topic. But I, I just wanted to say that the Kia Stinger is awesome. <laughs> but. The, the 11 to 20 year plan is very, very ambitious, but I do want to build my own car. From the ground up, chassis, I'll use, I'll use motors from other people. There's no reason to engineer my own motor unless I can find something that needs massive improvement over what's already out there. But the, all the offerings from all the manufacturers are very, very well done. But 11 to 20, years 11 to 20 are where I want to focus on building my own car company. Safe, reliable, and fun. Those are the only, it's got to look good, but if it's, let's be honest, the, the Mazda Miata, some of them aren't really that good looking. Some of them look great, but... Some of them aren't really that good looking. They got a little fat. They got a little. They got a little bloated. They got a little chunky. Um, but they were still very fun to drive, and they are relatively safe. And they're they're not they're not quick. I think they've gotten quicker now. But the Miata was never a fast car. But they were relatively safe, very reliable, and incredibly fun. And so that's a combination right there that I think will sell a good amount of cars, as long as it's reasonably priced. You can have a safe, reliable, and fun car that costs you $100,000, and you're only going to sell a few of them. Uh, you could also have a $10,000 car that's not safe, it's not reliable, and it's not fun, and again, nobody's going to buy it. So, years 11 to 20 is about building, that's, that's a whole different plan, but the... The ambition there is to build a safe, reliable, and fun electric car. Doesn't have to be a family sedan. It could be a two-seater, it could be a two plus two, whatever it is. The, the car I really had a lot of hopes for was the Honda Urban EV. A little two-door retro-styled hot hatch. Uh, it could be front-wheel drive, could be rear-wheel drive, it doesn't matter. The architecture isn't going to change very much. 
Uh, that's a good thing with electric motors is it, it can go front, it can go rear, it can go both. It doesn't matter. The as long as you have a, a design that can accommodate it. But the Honda Urban EV concept, tiny little two door, almost look like a 1990 GTI. Uh, Smoothed out, had LED headlights, had the big, the, the big long open grill. Cool, really, really cool looking car. Um, but everything I've seen since then, it, it looks like a four door hatchback family sedan. Which I guess, I guess manufacturers got to focus on what sells the most. Um, I don't have the analytics to see what sells the most they they know what sells and they're going to focus on that but i think a nice little two-door two-door front-wheel drive lightweight nimble hot hatch ev is going to sell i really do and we'll see in 10 years maybe that'll still be the case maybe it won't i don't know but uh, again safe reliable and fun uh, I want to build a car that encompasses those three safety first, reliable, and fun. Safety safety is always going to be paramount because we can't have uh, we can't have those old school Chinese cars, whatever they were, that they hit the wall and they completely disintegrate and everybody inside is dead. Can't have that. Um, cars are getting faster. Eventually, I do see the speed limits on the roads and the infrastructure once we rebuild our disgustingly deteriorated infrastructure. Once that gets rebuilt, I do see the national speed limits starting to come up. I wouldn't be surprised if in 20, 30 years we have 85 to 100 mile an hour speed limits. Um, and then we have designated lanes that are higher than that for specially licensed people and maybe autonomous driving. Um, that's a possibility. Um, if I had my way, there would be a tiered licensing system and uh, each license would allow you in different parts of the roadway. Tier one would be like your basic junior license. You can go back and forth to school on your tertiary roads and go to work if needed, but uh, you're not allowed on the highways. Uh, tier two is you're allowed on the highways and everything like that. And uh, tier three is you're allowed on the interstates and the, the high speed lanes where you can, you can go 100, 120 miles an hour, like the Autobahn. Um, you and I can't go fly over to Germany, get a get a Porsche and hop on the Autobahn. It just it does not happen that way, and for good reason because you can't have. Everyone thinks they're the best driver in the world. I am a very good driver, not not tooting my own horn, but I I have honed my skills over the years, and I'm constantly challenging myself and updating my my license, but. I can't go over, hop in a Porsche, hop in the left lane of the Autobahn and just blast 180 miles an hour. They will pull me over and they will throw me in jail. And rightfully so. So I do think we need to have a tiered licensing system here in the United States, but that's not going to happen. Not anytime soon. But I'd like to see, I'd like to see a complete overhaul of our infrastructure and our licensing systems and everything like that. We, we got to do something about it. We really do. We really, really, really do. But we'll see. The uh, We'll see how everything goes. Again, the first five years is going to be building up the business. The second five years is going to be perfecting the business, um, using the meticulous mindset, and the following 10 years is going to be about building my own car company. I need a good team behind me. Right now I'm by myself. Um, just I'm laying the foundation to bring in people who can grow this into something that is substantial. 
want to be able to build this up to provide unparalleled service, really, really awesome stuff, and give back to the community. We've deteriorated as a society, and we need to we need to take a step back and look how we can fix it. We gotta stop pointing fingers. We need to fix it. So one of the things I'm going to be doing once the weather warms up is I'm going to be having uh, car washes and barbecues and, and community outreach services here at the shop. Open to whoever. Uh, kids want to come down and, and learn something, learn about detailing, learn about electric cars, learn about computer hardware. It's, it'll be open to everybody. Uh, any proceeds raised will get donated to different charities all over the island. Uh, we'll be doing food drives, uh, Toys for Tots type deals, stuff like that. Uh, just to give back to the community because we we need to rebuild. We need to focus on, on what we can directly impact and rebuild from here and then those people can go and hopefully they can rebuild something else and it's like a it becomes a viral thing um, I would love to see community outreach grow virally we don't need to see people freaking out in a vape shop uh, because of what someone's wearing um, that we don't need to keep seeing that kind of viral stuff we need uh, positive viral growth where I can I can help out two people and then they can each go out and they can help two people and then each one of those can go out and help two people and just constantly expand. That's the goal. Uh, I'm very, very ambitious. I'm very naive as well, but I don't let that stop me. Um, the naivety can if I, I can I can outweigh the naivety just through just sheer willpower. I, I truly believe that, but we'll see. Over the next few years, this is going to be this is going to be a fun ride, and I welcome everybody down to the shop. My door is always open. You can come in, sit down, watch TV. We got a we got a 70 inch TV. We got Xbox. I got Wii, um, Amazon, Netflix, uh, Spotify, Pandora. I got a refrigerator full of horrible drinks. Uh, big comfy couch. It's even got a pull-out bed. Um, no, you're not sleeping on my couch unless you really, really need to. But that's that's not that's not gonna always be there. Um, I sleep here sometimes. But uh, yeah, that's that's where we're at. I welcome anybody to come down, hang out, have a good time, and. Uh, can help me. I, I could use some help growing this because all I want to do is is build something substantial to be able to give back. And I know I can't do it alone. Um, I'm doing it alone right now, but I can't do it alone. So I could use some help. I would love some help. Uh, I'd love for people to just come hang out, have a good time. Uh, we can all learn something in a in a dynamic environment like that, and uh, that's all I want. I want I want society to move forward. We're moving backwards right now. We need to move forward. Um, my company motto is "Semper Diemseps," which is Latin for "Always Forward." We just we got to keep moving forward, always, no matter what, move forward. We can't focus on the negatives in life. If we focused on the negatives in life, we'd never go anywhere. And unfortunately, that's what's happening. We're focusing on the negatives and we're not moving forward. We have stagnated. We are not, we're not going anywhere. We're not doing anything. As a society, we are still the same. We are just more connected, but more disconnected. We've become more connected with people on our phones and more disconnected with actual people. And that's another thing that's got to change. But now we're getting into moral things and whatnot, but Again, my door is always open. Come down, hang out. Keep me from losing my mind because I'm talking to myself again. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. I will leave off with... Uh, you have yourself a very happy new year. 
I wish nothing but health and prosperity to everybody. Um, I want to grow this business and I want to bring you all with me. So I look forward to meeting you, hanging out with you, and making something awesome. So you have yourself a wonderful day, and remember, always forward.